Okay, so you're going to go to Google Classroom and you'll want to click where it says under your stream, stop for interlopers and we're looking at the reading. So the one that says reading. If you click on it, it should look like this. So a little background on this story, it is going to be fictional, which means it's not true. Um, it's about two men whose families have fought their whole lives. And so um, they have been fighting over a piece of land. And it's not even a really good piece of land, it's, they're really just fighting for the sake of fighting. It's like marshy, wet, gross land. And yet they've been fighting it over their whole lives. And in the story, fighting enough that they would be willing to kill each other over that piece of land. And so, um, we're going to be reading a little bit about um, that. And as we go through, we're looking for the types of conflict. So hopefully you did a little bit of introduction with conflict. So we had, um, Person versus person. Does anybody remember what that is? No. You can look at your notes if you want. Yes. Is it like two people fighting an election almost, or it doesn't have to be physical? Right. So it, it, it's where they're having a problem with each other, right? I can have a problem with you without actually physically fighting with you, right? Um, so it's when there's some type of a conflict. It can be fighting though, as it is in this story. Now there is going to be character versus nature. Does anybody know what that is? What do you think? Make a wild guess. We said person versus nature. What do you think that that means? I'm coming. I'm having a problem with. Yes. What do you think? Weather. Okay. Weather could be it. Could be animals. Anything that you would find in the nature, right? That would cause you some type of difficulty. Tornado, hurricane, right? Those things for sure. So I talk about character versus fate. Does anybody know what that word fate means? It's almost like a chosen path. Right, like you really have no control over what's happening to you. It was destined to be that way forever. So, um, you know, I, I really wanted to be a doctor, but my destiny is to be a teacher. So no matter what I do, everything in life points me towards being a teacher, right? Because that's what your destiny is. Some people believe that and some people don't. How about a character versus society? This one is really difficult. I don't expect that you will know or understand it right off. Do you have a guess? I just don't know if it's right. You're fine. Guess is fine. Um, society has certain rules. Like, right. Or even an expectation, like, I don't expect you to pick your nose, right? So, like, I'm never a problem with somebody sitting over there picking their nose. No, it's not even that bad of a thing, right? It's just, like, not what we do in front of people, right? So, it's what society deems as being wrong. So, it could be something even more so, like, Abortion, right? I want to have an abortion, but society thinks that that's wrong. And so society looks down on me. It's a problem that I'm going to have with society. And when I talk to people about that, they're going to have a problem with it. Does that make sense? So it's an issue. It can be a law, um, but it doesn't have to be. It could just be something that people think isn't right. So in this story, the society issue is you really shouldn't go hunting for a person. 
if I tell you, hey guys, I'm going to go out today and, and shoot a guy, that is probably not okay with you. You're probably going to go tell somebody, right? I would expect you to, because that's not okay in our society, right? So you're probably going to go tell someone if I tell you that, right? Okay. So they get them all person versus person, character versus character, character versus, oh, self. I didn't talk about that. Maybe they don't have a problem with themselves. Like they really want to do something, but they know they shouldn't. Or you change your mind. Is that possible? So it's like having this problem with yourself. Like, yeah, I really want to go to this party, but I know my parents don't want me to go, right? It's like a conflict with yourself. Does that make sense? Maybe, yes, no? Okay. So, we are going to be um, looking here at interlopers, and we are finished with this. You'll be looking for those types of conflicts. So, as we're watching this, watching the story, as we're reading the story, I want you to be kind of thinking about the plot line. I'll go through that with you. But also, we're going to um, be <clears throat> looking for those types of conflict that show up in here. And there's a type for each one of those that I talked about, okay? So as we're reading, that's kind of what you're looking for, okay? And an interloper is somebody that goes on somebody's property without their permission. And both of these men think that the other is an interloper, okay? So if you see a sign that says, do not enter, and you go on, that's what you're considered as an interloper. So that's what where the name come from, comes from in the story, okay? Everybody good with that? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and read this to you, and um, you should try following along. There are some words in here that are a little difficult, that's okay. Just try to get the main idea or the gist of what's happening, and when we're done, we'll watch a little film that's going to help us with that, and we'll talk through it, so that um, if you feel a little lost, that's okay. Is everybody good with that? The story was written in the 1900s, so the language is a little off. Just move over it if you don't understand it, okay? You'll understand the biggest points, and that's all that matters. In a forest of mixed growth, somewhere on the eastern spurs of the Carpathians, a man stood one winter night watching and listening, as though he waited for some beast of the woods to come within the range of his vision and later of his rifle, but the game for whose presence he kept so keen an outlook was none that figured in the sportsman's calendar as lawful and proper for the chase. Aldrich von Gonrich patrols the dark forest in a quest of a human enemy. So again, I'm telling you, this is probably an issue with society. You shouldn't go out hunting for a person, right? The forest lands of Broadwoods were of wide extent and well stocked with game. The narrow strip of precipice woodland that lay on its outskirts was not remarkable for the game it harbored or the shooting it afforded, but it was the most jealously guarded of all its owner's territorial possessions. A famous lawsuit in the days of his grandfather had wrestled it from the illegal possession of a neighboring family of petty landowners. The dispossessed party had never acquiesced in the judgment of the court, and a long series of poaching of frays and similar scandals had embittered the relationship between the families for three generations. The neighbor feud had grown into a personal one since Ulrich had come to be head of his family. If there was a man in the world who he detested and wished ill to, it was George Zynum, the inheritor of the quarrel and the tireless game snatcher and raider of the disputed border forest. The feud might perhaps have died down or been compromised if the personal ill will of the two men had not stood in the way. As boys, they had thirsted for one another's blood, as men each prayed that misfortune might fall on the other. And this winds how scored winter night Ulrich had band together his foresters to watch the dark forest not in a quest of four-footed quarry, but to keep a lookout for the prowling thieves whom he suspected of being afoot from across the land boundary. The roebuck, which usually kept in the sheltered hollows during a storm wind, were running like driven things tonight, and there was movement and unrest among the creatures 
that were wont to sleep through the dark hours. Assuredly, there was a disturbing element in the forest, and Ulrich could guess the quarter from whence it came. He stayed away by himself from the watchers whom he had placed in ambush on the crest of the hill, and wandered far down the steep slopes amid the wild tangle of undergrowth peering through the tree trunks and listening to the whistling and scrolling of the wind and the breathless beating of the branches for sight and sound of the martyrs. If only on this wild night and this dark lone spot, he might come across George Zion, a man to man with none to witness that was the wish that was utmost in his thoughts. And as he stepped around the trunk of the huge beech, he came face to face with the man he sought. So now they're looking at each other, right? So we know that this is a, a conflict between character and character. We, we They built that up for us, right? We know he's not looking at his friend, right? He's looking at somebody that he does not like. The two enemies stood glaring at one another for a long silent moment. Each had a rifle in his hand, each had hate in his heart and murder emotions in his mind. The chance had come to give full play to the passions of a lifetime. But a man who has been brought up under the code of a strange civilization cannot easily nerve himself to shoot down his neighbor in cold blood and without words spoken except for an offense against his hearth and honor and before the movement of hesitation that gave way to action of deed of nature's own violence overwhelmed them both. A fierce streak of storm had been answered by a splitting crash over their heads and ere they could leap aside a mass of falling beech tree had thundered down on them. Ulrich von Gronwitz found himself stretched on the ground, one arm numb beneath him and the other held almost as helpless in a tight tangle of forked branches. While both legs were pinned beneath the fallen mass, his heavy shooting boots had saved his feet from being crushed to pieces. But if his fractures were not as serious as they might have been, at least it was evident that he could not move from his present position till someone came to release him. The descending twig had slashed the skin of his face, and he had to wink away some drops of blood from his eyelashes before he could take in general view of the disaster. At his side, so near and under ordinary circumstances, he could almost have touched them, lay George Zynum, alive and struggling, but obviously as helplessly pinioned down as himself. All around them lay a thick strewn wreckage of splintered branches and broken twigs. 